Hello everyone, my name is Fox. This is going to be my review on Ambernic's latest handheld, the RG552. Thank you very much to Ambernic for sending this device out to me for review. I've had this device now for around eight to nine days, so I've been using it pretty extensively, mostly with Android. I have updated this to the latest Android build that Ambernic has released. It fixes the right analog stick as well as includes the Google Play Store. So far, I am a big fan of it with a few caveats, and we'll get into that later on in this review. First, let's go ahead and touch base on the specs themselves. So we are looking at the Rockchip 3399 Hexacore SoC. It's rocking the dual Cortex A72 CPUs as well as quad Cortex A53 CPUs backing them up. It's using the Mali T860 GPU and has a sizable amount of RAM at 4 gigabytes of LPDDR4 RAM. On board is 64 gigabytes of eMMC 5.1 NAND, which is really nice to have. The screen's a 5.36 inch 1920 by 1152 IPS full lamination OCA screen. Its aspect ratio is 5.3. Really is kind of like a nice middle ground for retro gaming purposes. It also features 10 point multi-touch. On the battery side of things it is using two lithium cells both of them rated at 3200 milliamp hours so each one is 3.7 volt for when they combine 2s1p at 7.6 volt uh, with a combined total of around 24 watt hour of battery life that's really the guts of what the specs are if we take a look at what's inside the box outside of the device itself it also includes a 30 watt charger which you can find right here Inside is a very nice PD compliant 30 watt charger. You can see with the little fold out part. And the US plugs are actually qualified for US plugs. They actually have the holes in there in case this gets shorted so that they get broken off in here instead of the entire stud getting left inside. We'll go ahead and put that back inside. Underneath this, we actually have the two micro SD card that include the that are included for the Linux build to run. All right, let's start this review off by talking about the general build quality of the device. Now, it is all plastic build quality, but it is super, super durable. Like, even trying to flex this case doesn't really happen. Additionally, even though there's only four screws holding this together, taking this back piece off, these clips that hold it all together, are, like, hanging on for dear life. Like, uh, I unfortunately did not use my plastic spudger. And you can see right here that I actually scratched it a little bit because I was trying to pry it open with a, uh, a flathead screwdriver and it just slipped and just cut right into it. So I just started pulling on this and I was bending the, the crap out of this plastic and it's returned to its original shape with no problem whatsoever. So the plastic itself is super, super durable, uh, really high quality. Now these analog sticks that you see here, these are like the traditional type of switch analog sticks that have been making their way to a lot of these handhelds so these might be types of clone uh, switch analog sticks however they aren't that bad specifically with regard to the how they operate how Ambernic has them operating they have a very very small dead zone they don't really want to hug that much so the magnetism along the the cardinal there the magnetism that the analogs want to kind of stick and magnet to the cardinal directions it happens to a minor degree but not that much it's actually there is a fair amount of free play on there so i think that for the most part a lot of people that are analog purists will like these analog sticks especially with regard to having very small dead zones and kind of very one-to-one -one relationship to where you're pushing with some degree of magnetism to the cardinal directions so you'll get more very very straight arrow left right up down to a degree, but every now and again, as soon as you start passing through that dead zone, it'll kind of go straight off. The D-pad and buttons are still membrane-based, and they got a lot of snap to them. Like, you can, you can hear it. These membrane-based ones, typically, I am... I find membrane based to be hard to produce, but Ambernic has been making these so often and been making them such good quality that they really have kind of nailed it all down. Now, the one thing that I really want to talk about here is that the one thing that happens on every Ambernic D-pad that I've tried is that the southeast side of the D-pad definitely always needs to get broken in. And as much as I tried, this time I've like literally eight days I've been putting into this, just constantly rolling into this southeast quadrant of the D-pad just to try to make sure that I can finesse it easier. Overall, it's still not nearly as good as the southwest part of the D-pad. Now, I'm not really using the upper diagonals all that much, especially for like fighting games. When you're just talking about just general cardinal directions, it's really nice. Now, there are a few things that I want to talk about when we talk about D-pad quality. 
Now, obviously, being able to finesse it and have the control do exactly what you're looking to do is paramount. So these in that regard are like what I would consider like an A minus grade. For the most part, almost every direction that you're going to want to input happens as you want it to, except for this particular southeast part. I've I've not been able to have nearly like I'm like 70% accurate whenever I need this to actually fire. Every other place, especially like over here, this is like almost like 100%. So it's weird that this happens. Now, I have used like a PS Vita D-pad. And if you do a compare and contrast between those, I'll be able to like, you know, like cap do it all day, just hammering the diagonals with a PS Vita D-pad. So it's not really, you know, uh, a case of me just not being very good on the Southeast Quadrant. It's really just has to do with Anbernick's D-pad because it happens on every one of their D-pads. Having said that, that's one part of it. So if we were to just take a look at the D-pad from a membrane and saying fidelity of finessing input, it's around an A minus. Now, one thing that I really like because it has that snap, you know, you can hear that. That is tactile feedback. That tactile feedback is really important. This is like anti-mushy, right? So a D-pad that is mushy, it means that it how do you qualify a mushy deep pad? A mushy deep pad is like, well, why is a mushy deep pad bad? A mushy deep pad is bad because when you're pressing down to press down, like if you're using a lot of force, there is a fatigue that will happen on your thumb just pressing down all the time. And it's tiring. It sucks to to use a mushy deep pad. Ambernick's deep pads are not mushy. They got a lot of snap to them. So in that regard, like how crisp they are, they're really, really good. Overall, I would say that the D-pad on the 552 is much like how all other Ambernick style stuff is, and I would rate them as like an A minus grade overall. There are better D-pads that I had, but being membrane based, this D-pad really is quite excellent. A minus on that, and that you know goes along with the face buttons as well. These just like they're just sensational. Like these go along with the uh, the D-pad. So as face buttons go. I would say that these are pretty much A+. Plus. They got good snap to them. There's zero question that they're working. As soon as you press it, you get that instant feedback. No fatigue. Really good face buttons. Now, these trigger buttons. These trigger buttons, how they're staggered like this. Now, it's great to have a slim profile for the trigger buttons themselves so that you can have this very slim type of candy bar form factor. However, in practice, especially because this design of the D-pad and analogs are very PlayStation style, but it is D-pad dominant. What that means is that because your thumb is going to naturally sit your like my thumbs are naturally sitting where the D-pad and the face buttons are. This is great because the system is designed mostly for retro gaming. So if we're mostly going to be doing retro gaming, having a D-pad dominant with face pad dominant for your thumbs, this is the preferred layout for a handheld for retro games just because most retro games use the d-pad they didn't use analog sticks so having an analog stick on the left side be dominant is more for modern games with 3d based movement because you're going to want analog movement in a 3d based game and then typically you would have the analog stick down on the bottom for just general aiming but the problem is is that especially because we have android here and we are it is capable of game streaming what happens is is that when you're when you're playing it's you have this like weird hook just to try to hit R2, which would be a normal trigger, which is down over here. So what winds up happening is you have this really weird stretch that happens and it becomes super uncomfortable to actually play any game that would require using mouse look on right stick and firing on the traditional R2. So you'd typically want to switch that to be R run. In instances where you can't switch that, it becomes very uncomfortable to play and almost really not really nice. So trigger wise how we have it staggered like this makes it really nice for having a slim device but for actual use it's better to have r1 here and r2 back here as well as l3 uh l1 and l2 so going forward hopefully ambernix devices have a more traditional trigger layout as opposed to the staggered layout because how this is just doesn't mean it just it's not really nice now the other thing that i want to talk about we've we've talked about most of the inputs and the triggers the one thing that kind of bothers me a bit is this power button. If we take a look right here, you can see that it's not flush with the device. Now, it has happened that in my use of this over time is that I accidentally do press this 
And even though the device doesn't properly go to sleep, it's not the hugest problem, but because it's so easy to press, uh, it happens enough that uh, it's annoying. Now, what's weird about this is that the RG 351P had this power button recessed. And this is something that I brought up multiple times. And I don't know how they could have regressed to this point when Ambernick has already designed a recessed power button prior. So <laughs> they've done it before and it was good. And then they made this for whatever reason, I don't know. Uh, so overall, that's kind of unfortunate. If we take a look on the inside of the device, uh, the PCB layout looks actually really well made. The only thing that I would say is that the Wi-Fi is the real like Achilles heel of this entire device. Also having just one antenna doesn't make me feel all that comfortable. I don't really know enough about Wi-Fi radios and, and whatnot, but typically every Wi-Fi card I've seen has had two antennas. So having just one antenna is not ideal. And when looking at how it works with game streaming, it's just not there. So perhaps two antennas would have been good, but definitely five gigahertz at the very least would have been preferable. So this is kind of like good enough for just downloading and using your device for regular data, but actually using the device for game streaming is, is not pleasant at all. So that's really one of the unfortunate things about this uh, device. Now, if we take a look at the battery, they are using two S1P. There's two cells, two 3.7 volt cells at 7.6 volt. Uh, it is around 24 watt hour. Now I have done battery tests on this where I gunned the CPU had max brightness. Uh, I basically got three hours of battery life, which would suggest that the total system power, everything running full, uh, full brightness, chip going crazy, the fan operating at max, that takes eight watts. So if we take if we take that into consideration, the worst case battery life really is around three hours of battery life, maybe slightly less. Uh, and then you could get better battery life if we were to talk about you know, using uh, lesser emulators, so stuff that like Nintendo or just regular Game Boy, you could get by with using less power in things that demand less. Uh, but I really wouldn't anticipate more than five hours. Just as a general setting, I would say that it's three hours is what you should like kind of be thinking about. Now, it does take 90 minutes to charge. It fast charges very, very quickly, which is great. However, because Android isn't in a perfect state right now, the standby isn't working as it should. And I've only gotten 36 hours at a full charge on standby, which really isn't very good at all. That's like completely idle. If you had a game running, the standby time is even worse. So really what you have to do is when you're playing a game, you have to save, you have to quit out. You almost have to power down the machine just to make sure that you can power back on and play it again because standby right now is not reliable. Now, Ambernick has sent this device out to many, many uh, developers, and I'm hoping that this gets fixed in the immediate short term. But for right now, this is something that I have to include in my review just because it is what is on my device as it is. Now, when we're talking about all of that, obviously we should talk about thermals as well because it has a heat sink and fan. Now, this is actually a really positive thing. I have taken a thermal camera out of uh, playing this device for about 30 minutes, and there is no thermal radiation from the heat sink uh, and fan that radiates outward to the case itself at all. So uh, you may see that it may look like it's a little bit hot in this picture, but if you compare it to my hand, my hand is actually hotter than the device itself. Even after 30 minutes of it going hardcore on emulating. So uh, overall thermals on the device are very, very good. The fan does kick in, but it doesn't really get much past being inaudible. Uh, it's audible, like you can notice it, but it doesn't get anywhere to the point that I found it to be annoying. Okay, before we get to the gameplay segments and the conclusion of this particular review, I want to take a look at total input latency via the lens of Android gameplay. Now, I have only done Android gameplay. I'm specifically waiting for Linux to be more fully baked on the 552 before I take a look at it, and I will take a look at it once it gets to that point. Having said that, I am recording at 240 FPS. I've written a program that will help display frame counts so that you can see frame counts as they happen. I've done two different tests using the SNES 9X core on RetroArch, the current one. And I've done it with run ahead and without run ahead. Without run ahead would basically be what you would consider the default preset and what most everyone's going to do unless you actually step in and try to improve it. I do really recommend using run ahead as you will improve what that is. I'd also say tweak uh, polling instances, either late or early. Specifically, early I found it to be a little bit better. Having said that, 
trying to make this more easily digestible and kind of putting a grade score at the end of this, if we were to take as a best case scenario, the lower bounds is around 70 milliseconds of total input latency and on the upper bounds being 100 milliseconds of total input latency, which really isn't fantastic. It's not terrible, but it's good. It's fine. It's like a B minus is what I would kind of grade it as. To put it in comparison perspective, PS4, Xbox One, playing modern games have worse total input latency than this. So if you've played games on modern systems with modern games and found that you didn't mind how fast the response was when you were controlling everything, chances are you will find it just fine when you play on this handheld because it's slightly better, not as good as retro games were, especially on CRTs and stuff, but not terrible. It's completely playable and totally controllable. Like I said, it's around a B minus. Uh, it has been better on other Android devices that I've tried. So this is worse than other Android devices that I've played on, but it's still not terrible. Crest to all rangers. The energy core temperature is reaching dangerous levels. Reports confirm that workers are still trapped inside. Rangers report to the emergency staging area for immediate transport. Jealous and big.
I'm going to conclude this video with the Halo Infinite game stream going on right now. This is more just to say that it really isn't good enough. You can clearly see that there's just tons of latency introduced like sporadically throughout. It's cumbersome. It's not very fun to play. I am hopeful that with updates, maybe this might be better, but overall, I'm not optimistic with the game streaming side. I am optimistic with better emulation and better gameplay. That is something that I am looking forward to. I think that there is a lot of potential at the RG552. Right now, as it is, it is quite good. It is a step above the RK3326 devices, for sure. There's a lot to love about the device. The main things that are holding the device back for me are the battery and the Wi-Fi chipset. As always, guys, thank you for your time. And thanks for watching.